This hearing will come to order. Uh, let me thank our witnesses for joining us today to discuss the turmoil and instability plaguing the Sahel. While the region may not often make front page news, millions of people continue to face threats from militaries that are supposed to protect them, ethnically based militias, and dire food insecurity. These threats had displaced 2.4 million people in the central Sahel by this May, and more than 30 million people in the Sahel will need life-saving assistance and protection this year, nearly 2 million more than last year, according to the UN Coordinator for Humanitarian Affairs. Unfortunately, some of the militaries in the sub-region, militaries which we trained and equipped, by the way, have contributed to the problem instead of being a stabilizing force. They have undertaken coups in Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, and attempted one in uh, Niger. And particularly in Mali, the military has committed gross human rights abuses in the course of counterterrorism operations with little to no accountability. Making matters worse, Russia has established a foothold in Mali through the Wagner Group and is also involved in human rights violations, including extrajudicial killings of civilians. In the wake of the coup in Chad, the junta fired live ammunition at peaceful protesters, killing seven, wounding dozens more, and it has yet to commit to the transition timeline the African Union articulated a year ago. For two decades, the United States and our partners have spent billions of dollars to aid stability efforts by supporting military operations against terrorist actors and by strengthening the military capacity of countries in the Sahel to counter the threat of violent extremists. Successive administrations have used both state and Defense Department programs to provide equipment and train militaries, including deploying U.S. forces to assist African soldiers at the devastating cost of American lives. All of us remember the tragic deaths of four American Special Operations soldiers who were killed in Niger in 2017 when they were ambushed by militants belonging to the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara. And our partners have suffered casualties as well. Scores of soldiers from Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, Chad, and France have deployed in successive operations and have lost their lives. The UN peacekeeping mission in Mali is the deadliest in the world. Just last month, two more peacekeepers were killed by an improvised explosive. And despite all of our efforts, we have little positive to show. In 2019, the head of special operations in Africa, General Marcus Hicks, told Voice of America with regards to the fight against terrorism in the Sahel, and I quote, I would tell you at this time, we are not winning. Clearly, the situation has only deteriorated. And while we invested billions in the security sector, our diplomatic and development efforts have been undercut by a lack of resources and presence. Significant staffing shortages at our embassies and lack of a robust USAID presence in the Sahel are limiting our ability to balance our security programs with tackling the root causes of extremism in the Sahel. I appreciate the engagement from the administration with regards to the requirement to consult with this committee on that strategy. And in the wake of this hearing, I and other members will provide you with feedback on your approach. Yesterday, I introduced a resolution calling for a democratic transition in the Republic of Chad. It demands General Duby release those arrested during the protest this spring. It supports the African Union's push to organize elections by October 22nd. It calls on the military junta to abide by the African Union's transition timeline, and it asks the Secretary of State to identify coup leaders and their accomplices in order to target them with visa restrictions and financial sanctions. In addition to this, in March, Congress passed the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership Program Act of 2021, which I sponsored in the Senate. This legislation aims to ensure that we have a strategy to address the political, governance, and development challenges in North and West Africa. At today's hearing, <clears throat> excuse me, I expect our witnesses to share their frank assessments of whether the U.S. approach over the years have yielded the results that we expected, and if not, what do we need to change? With that, let me turn to the ranking member, uh, both of the, on the subcommittee and for this hearing, uh, Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is a pleasure to serve as the ranking member for this hearing on U.S. policy toward the Sahel. This topic is an important one, and I appreciate the chairman prioritizing it for a full committee hearing today. It is also good to see that we have essential leaders working on Africa policy for DOD, state, and USAID to have this critical discussion. 
During this hearing, we have a lot to cover regarding the myriad challenges to regional security and development in the Sahel, including many vital issues creating a humanitarian crisis and impacting U.S. national security. The Sahel has been a region of significant insecurity and under underdevelopment for decades, owing to a profound lack of development. Niger is ranked last on the UN Human Development Index. Mali, Chad, and, and uh, Burkina Faso also feature in the bottom 10. The people of the Sahel are among the poorest in the world and face acute hardships from uh, desert, terrain, isolation, and an increasing threat from violent extremist groups affiliated with Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. I am concerned that U.S. foreign policy toward the Sahel has been challenged to keep pace with the threat or level of need. Deficits in our policy and approach and those of our allies seem to have allowed the situation in the Sahel to worsen. Despite the initial success of France's military intervention in Mali in 2013, these violent extremist groups have only grown in capacity and expanded their areas of control such as they now directly threaten our partners south of the Sahel on the west or on the coast of West Africa. I am concerned Africa has not received the U.S. diplomatic focus it deserves. Congress continues to follow closely the wave of military coup that have affected sub-Saharan Africa in the last two years. The majority of these recent coups have occurred in the Sahel. I look forward to hearing about the administration's assessment of what is driving these coups and how its plans to address them in a manner that promotes our interests while working behind the scenes with these regimes to promote our interests and values. In this context, Mali is worthy of emphasis. I look forward to a clear vision from the administration about how to enable the UN peacekeeping operation in Mali to make a positive contribution to regional stability and not just soak up resources. The entrance of the Russia-backed Wagner Group in Mali last year and the subsequent hasty withdrawal of French troops only compound the challenges faced by the U.S. and our European allies in the region. Concurrently, these developments create an opportunity for a renewed U.S. focus on Niger, which has been, for some time, the most promising partner in the region for the United States. Two weeks ago, the NSC shared the Biden administration's strategy in the Sahel with this committee. The strategy reflects the Biden administration's aspirational view of its plans to approach the region. It will hopefully drive important policy and resource discussions that need to occur. While the interagency approval and rollout of the Sahel strategy is a welcome development, I look forward to the administration's ability to implement such a strategy. My concerns focus on two main areas. First is concerning regarding interagency coordination to implement this strategy, including vital coordination between the State Department and Department of Defense, and second, the personnel deficit at many State Department posts across the Sahel. We must place qualified personnel with professional experience working on African policy uh, and, and issues critical in Africa in the Sahel if it is indeed a region of strategic priority. Senior leaders at our diplomatic posts in the Sahel should have essential qualifications, the least of which should be previous Africa experience and the ability to speak French. For junior level positions, the State Department urgently, urgently needs to figure out creative ways to incentivize service in this complex part of Africa. In the event that this requires additional resources, I look forward to the interagency providing these need requests to Congress. We have built up a great deal of goodwill through security cooperation and programs like PEPFAR. However, it is increasingly clear in this renewed age of strategic competition that what we have been doing in the past may not be enough. Losing influence in Africa to authoritarian competitors, whether their origin is African or from outside of the continent, has increased the likelihood that if we do not give our Africa policy the resources it deserves, we will lose influence to these competitors. Finally, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on whether the ways the State Department and DOD have organized themselves on Africa policy optimally 
supports U.S. diplomatic and security objectives. In particular, I am curious as to how the decision to depose Libya's Muammar Gaddafi in 2011 may have played a role in sparking the negative unintended consequences for the Sahel that we are discussing today. My interest stems from the fact that Libya was located within the State Department's Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs, while Sahel policy was governed by the State Department Bureau of African Affairs. Meanwhile, the African Union included all of Africa within its mandate, and AFRICOM included all of Africa except for Egypt. With an eye towards the future, I am interested in how these differences may have impeded information flows and policy coordination for the Sahel. I look forward to today's conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rounds. Uh, with us today on behalf of the administration is Ambassador Molly Fee, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Uh, Ambassador Fee is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, who most recently served as the Deputy Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation. Ambassador Fee was U.S. Ambassador to South Sudan from 2015 to 17, Deputy Chief of Mission of the U.S. Embassy in Ethiopia, and as Chief of Staff in the Office of the Special Envoy for Sudan in South Sudan. Uh, so she has extensive experience in this regard. Mr. Robert Jenkins serves as Assistant to the Administrator for the Bureau for Conflict Prevention and Stabilization. A career member of the Senior Executive Service, Mr. Jenkins was previously a Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance, and the Director of USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives. Uh, prior to joining USAID in 1998, Mr. Jenkins designed and implemented emergency relief and recovery programs with World Vision International in Southern Sudan and Sierra Leone. Our final witness today is uh, Ms. Uh, Chidi Blyden, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for African Affairs. Ms. Blyden is an expert on Africa's conflict, security, development issues. She served in the Obama administration as a special assistant to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for African Affairs from 2013 to 17. She managed several functional and regional responsibilities, including U.S. Africa defense policy for East and Central Africa, served as the African Peacekeeping Advisor to the Stability and Humanitarian Affairs Office, and was the department's lead on the President's Africa Peacekeeping Rapid Response Partnership Initiative. So again, welcome to all of you. Uh, we'd ask you to, um, um, to um, summarize your, your full statements will be included for the record without objection. We'd ask you to summarize them in about five minutes so the committee and its members can have a conversation with you on these issues. Um, we thank you for your service, and we ask that you proceed with your testimonies in the order in which I introduced you. So, Ambassador Fee, you'll start. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rounds, and other colleagues of the committee. I want to start by thanking you for your longstanding interest and engagement in the Sahel. Instability in the Sahel is a security problem with a governance solution. A decade of a security-focused approach has underscored this lesson as armed groups continue to expand their presence and capabilities despite French counterterrorism operations and significant Western investments in African national security capabilities. Mr. Chairman, you mentioned the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership Program. I think it's clear that that progress, to put it nicely, has not been linear and increasingly inadequate given the expanding number of terrorist incidents and civilian casualties. But our efforts have afforded us numerous lessons learned that we continue to take into account as we revise our approach to the Sahel. As we have found in the Middle East and in Southwest Asia, we must address the underlying drivers of insecurity to effectively support efforts by African partners to turn the tide. First, we must be realistic about the daunting social, environmental, political, and economic conditions that overwhelm the Sahel. In order to contend with violent extremist groups, governments in the region must dramatically reform and improve. We can best encourage this required change by investing in governance. The new interagency Sahel strategy seeks to build the capacity of governments in the Sahel to provide equitable delivery of government services and to adopt measures to improve accountability, anti-corruption, and dialogue between capitals and the periphery and among communities. These are the keys to winning the support of civilian populations. The five-year strategy is sufficiently broad to withstand the blows of the kinds of crises and shifts we've seen recently. It allows U.S. embassies the flexibility to implement to greatest effect at the local level. 
I tell you frankly, however, that neither our African partners nor we will transform the Sahel within the first five years of this strategy. The goals we have identified call for action to promote fundamental policy and governance reforms that will take many years to undertake and implement. These are societal endeavors, which by their very nature are incremental. But the reorientation explicit in this strategy is an essential first step. Recent extra-constitutional changes of government in three of the five Sahelian countries have complicated the task. We need greater investment in democracy and governance programming, as well as more development assistance that targets underlying social, environmental, and economic deficiencies. In Mali, we, we welcome the recent agreement to a 24-month timeline between the regional bloc known as ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, and the transition government. We join ECOWAS in insisting that the transition government turn its full attention to implementing the reforms necessary to set Mali on the path to democracy. We stand ready to assist as long as the transition government moves towards a constitutional referendum and elections as envisioned. We are committed to the Malian people and their aspiration for responsive democratic governance. We know that Malian people also want security. The civilian casualties resulting from the reported tactics used by the Wagner Group alongside Malian armed forces will only serve to sow further divisions in Malian society, undermine the credibility of those armed forces, and drive communities into the hands of violent extremists. The UN mission, known as MINUSMA, shares our goal of protecting civilians. We will be watching closely to see how the mission operates without French reassurance flights from Operation Barkhane. We are also welcome the review envisioned in the new mandate to see how we can strengthen the mission's operations. We are very concerned by the statement made by Mali's transition government expressing its intent to deny MINUSMA the freedom of movement it is, needs to fulfill its mandate. Uh, we will be wor working closely to make sure that MINUSMA can carry out its mandate despite these verbal threats. In Burkina Faso, we are encouraged by the transition government's proposal to shorten the timeline to return Burkina to democratically elected civilian-led governance by six months. While the January 24th military coup d'etat triggered restrictions on U.S. assistance, we remain committed to helping the country under available authorities in order to address instability, prevent the spread of violent extremism, and support reforms to advance accountable democratic rule. Chad has a historic opportunity to change direction after decades of authoritarian rule. To capitalize on this, op on this opportunity, we have emphasized the importance of a peaceful, timely political transition in line with the principles outlined by the African Union 2021 communique. These include peaceful resolution of negotiations with the country's insurgent groups now taking place in Doha, hosting a national dialogue that is inclusive of all voices, and holding free and fair elections that lead to a democratically elected and civilian-led government. Mauritania remains one of our most stable partners in the Sahel. Uh, we continue to work to support the president's leadership in tackling terrorism and improving governance. The same is true in Niger, one of our most reliable and most willing partners in the Sahel. Uh, and we are, uh, value their partnership and are committed to supporting the leadership of the president. Finally, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, the new Sahel strategy identifies the threat to border countries in coastal West Africa which are most at risk from violent extremist spillover from the Sahel, as well as vulnerable to internal factors that mirror the governance challenges in the Sahel. We will use the lessons learned from the innovative approach outlined in the Global Fragility Act in coastal West Africa to inform and reinvigorate our programming and coordination in the Sahel. Thank you. Thank you, Administrator Jenkins. Chairman Menendez, thank you. Senator Rounds, distinguished members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today and for bringing attention to the urgent needs of this critically important region. I am particularly glad to be testifying with my colleagues from the State and Defense Departments as we are actively working to prevent the Sahel's problems from creeping into West African countries as we implement the Global Fragility Act and the U.S. strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability. Looking across the Sahel, we see a region where the confluences of U.S. national security interests means we must devote attention and resources to supporting key partners. We also see a region that is particularly fragile, with weak governments characterized by corruption and lack of accountability, unprofessional security forces, limited services and opportunities for citizens, 
intercommunal conflicts, large gender inequalities, and armed groups looking to recruit. The Sahel is beset by problems, many problems all exacerbating each other. It's a region where decades of undelivered promises have continuously eroded what were never strong, thriving democracies. It's a region where we've seen young people dancing in support of military takeovers, waving Russian flags, and repeating the disinformation that targets them relentlessly. And it's a region where violent extremists prey on a generation that sees little promise, holds little hope, feels little agency, and is desperate for many of life's most basic needs. Add the effects of climate change, like desertification and multi-seasonal drought, the impact of a pandemic on fragile political and public health systems, and the global food security crisis brought on by Putin's invasion of Ukraine, and you have a region in crisis. Each factor exacerbates the other, fragility begetting, begetting fragility. So what is to be done? U.S. foreign assistance has an important role to play in supporting partner governments to manage threats and improve stability and security. We need to bring fresh thinking and new tools to bear in reducing democratic backsliding, corruption, and other drivers of illegitimacy, combating disinformation, and limiting openings for malign external influence in the countries of the Sahel. We must support timely democratic transitions in Burkina Faso, Chad, and Mali, and critical political, social, economic, and governance reforms across the region to reduce corruption and prevent further democratic erosion. We should enable governments to enhance their presence in underserved areas and decentralize their service delivery, foster increased citizen trust in their governments, mitigate the risk of intercommunal conflict, improve business enabling environments, and reduce cycles of political instability by demonstrating that democracy can deliver tangible benefits for all. We must help our partners adapt and manage consequences of ongoing climate change and displacement. This will require close and genuine partnerships with local actors, including governments, civil society, and the private sector. None of this will take root without strengthening and expanding the role of African institutions in balancing regional threats and opportunities with underlying macroeconomic conditions. We will have to get better at shifting more leadership, ownership, decision-making, and implementation to the people and institutions who possess the capability, connectedness, and, and credibility to drive change in their own countries and communities. How can Congress help us? We cannot do this important work without the resources you generously provide every year. But USAID and other parts of the US government working this problem set cannot know with certainty the shape of the conflict years out. We ask you to consider granting more flexibility to allow us to adapt as the facts and needs on the ground change quickly. It's a model that has succeeded and one USAID wants to scale to the size of the problem. Similarly, USAID sees great utility in further conversation on flexible hiring mechanisms and better incentivizing our people to fill positions in the field where they are needed, often side by side with the Department of Defense and Department of State colleagues. Our missions and offices in the region are chronically understaffed, even though the work is critical to our national security. For all the enthusiasm of an integrated approach between departments and agencies here in Washington, the greatest difference comes in the field, alongside colleagues and international partners tackling these complex challenges together. Thank you again for convening this important hearing. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Secretary Blyden. Thank you, Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, Senator Rounds, and members of the committee. It is an honor to testify before you today alongside Assistant Secretary Fee to discuss the Department of Defense's DOD Sahel policy and how DOD is working to align its activities within the United States whole of government Sahel strategy. The National Defense Strategy outlines three high-level security priorities in Africa, namely countering violent extremist organizations, BEOs that pose a threat to the U.S. homeland and U.S. interests, two, strengthening allies and partners to support mutual security objectives, and three, addressing targeted strategic competition concerns that present a military risk to the United States. In the Sahel, these three priorities intersect in a manner that requires not only an integrated approach, but a whole-of-government approach. 
Over the past six months, we've seen that the intersection of these three challenges in the Sahel has resulted in military coups, unconstitutional political transitions, democratic backsliding in West Africa, the inherent spread of VEOs and an exponential increase in their attacks, the stabilizing presence of Russia's Wagner Group, and the withdrawal of French and other allied forces from Mali. These challenges transcend national borders and therefore require a coordinated regional approach. As such, it would behoove us to address them together with our African partners. VEOs are increasingly exploiting power vacuums, instability, local tensions, and weak government institutions and governing practices. These groups jeopardize stability, democracy, and peace, which further provides opportunities for extremism to proliferate, creating a vicious feedback loop that is fueled by a lack of good governance and human rights accountability. When governments struggle to maintain security, deliver essential services, uphold humanitarian principles, or even provide economic opportunities in conflict environments, conditions are ripe for VEOs to exploit and appeal to vulnerable and unprotected marginalized populations. Furthermore, illicit networks that traffic drugs, weapons, and persons across the continent create the conditions that empower VEOs and serve as a lucrative resource of revenue for these groups and allows for their expansion across the continent. There are over a dozen active ISIS and Al-Qaeda affiliates on the continent, from the Sahel to the Lake Chad Basin, from Somalia to DRC. These groups vary in their intent and capability to attack U.S. interests, with those in the Sahel among the most capable. In the Sahel, we've seen the rapid expansion and open movement of Jamaat Nar al-Islam wal Muslim, otherwise known as Jainim, and the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara, ISGS, within Mali, into neighboring Burkina Faso, Niger, and southward to the Western African littoral countries. VEOs continue to spread towards coastal West Africa, and if left unchecked, will add to existing security challenges in the Gulf of Guinea and coastal West Africa. DOD is working closely with state and USAID to develop programs for coastal West African countries as part of the Global Fragility Act, as mentioned by my colleagues, and the US strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability. The strategy implementation in coastal West Africa will help boost, uh, bolster coastal states against the encroachment of VEOs from the Sahel. An already complex situation in Mali has been exacerbated by the presence of Russian-backed Wagner Group, and additionally, the withdrawal of forces under the French Operation Varkhan have also um, created uh, challenges to allowing the MINUSMA mission or the United Nations mission in Mali uh, to continue its operations. Given these new and increasing challenges, we, the US, our allies, and especially our African partners need to consider the root of our counterterrorism efforts. As we've experienced in other key theaters, failing to understand the root causes of local levels at, at the local level and understanding our partners, their will to fight can have significant consequences. We need to integrate our entire approach in the Sahel with our African partners, or we risk undermining our own efforts and providing additional opportunities for VEOs and strategic competitors to gain access and influence. Niger is one of our most critical and crucial security partners in the Sahel, and they continue to set the example of democracy in the region. We need to continue to support the government of Niger as our partnership with them is critical to success in the region. In Mauritania, we hope to increase professionalization engagements with Sahel partners. Given its lengthy border with Mali and hosting the G5 Sahel Defense College, enabling Mauritania into a more active role as part of the broader Sahel strategy is important. While Chad remains one of the most capable partners in the region, ending our US security cooperation has affected our bilateral engagement. As the Transitional Military Council works towards a return to democratically elected and civilian-led government, we remain committed to supporting the will of the Chadian people. Chad was only one of six countries of the African continent to endorse Russia's suspension from the UN Human Rights Council. Chad is faced with terrorist threats, humanitarian crisis, and malign Russian influence in its own region. The United States has the potential to provide meaningful security cooperation to train Chad's military and civilian services, especially given its role as a troop contributor in the UN and regional peace operations. We are encouraging our European allies and African partners operating in the Sahel to adopt a similar approach to what you'll hear about from the Sahel strategy, one that seeks solutions that are integrated, whole of government, and African-led. We assess that unilateral military action is insufficient to address the scope of threats we face on the continent. And although the continent is awash with new initiatives, it would truly benefit from management of the international community's support to our partners and their locally supported efforts. To this end, we continue to better understand our partner security needs, designing and implementing our programs and engagements along mutual priorities. 
As we examine a new approach in the Sahel, it is critical for us to work with our African partners in order to implement a shared vision for the future of African security. Our role here is to enable African partners to be successful in owning their own security for their benefit and ours. And the best way to help them own their own security is to allow them to lead, shaping our support to their efforts. Our adversaries are well aware of Africa's strategic potential and are devoting resources and time to strengthen their partnerships on the continent. As part of its engagement, Russia and the PRC routinely provide training and defense articles to African nations. While our African partners have stated repeatedly that they prefer our training and defense articles, they turn to our competitors when we are not responsive to their requests. We must work to be more responsive and more present if we are to succeed in this arena. Let us not forget the PRC seeks to expand its access. And the PRC basing on the continent remains a key concern. As this committee is probably aware, the PRC seeks to open additional bases tying their commercial seaport investments in East, West, and Southern Africa closely with involvement by Chinese military forces in order to further, for, further their geostrategic interests. Ms. Blyden, you've been about seven minutes, so you sure, can sir. summarize for us. I will wrap up. In conclusion, the Sahel is a region where our three NDS priorities in Africa intersect, requiring an integrated whole of government approach that leverages our allies and partners, but puts our African partners in the lead with respect to restoring and preserving security on the continent. I apologize for taking a little extra time. Thank you very much. Um, start around five minutes. Uh, I'm pleased to know that the administration is on track to deliver a strategy for the Sahel in keeping with the requirements of the Trans-Sahel Counterterrorism Partnership Program Act of 2021, which I sponsored. I appreciate the consultations that have occurred to date on the staff level, and I consider this hearing a continuation of those consultations. As I mentioned during my opening statement, uh, I will have input into the strategy as a result of our conversations and uh, today and those that have taken place. But I'd like each of our witnesses to elaborate on the following question. For two decades, successive administrations have focused heavily on security in the Sahel. I agree that security must be one element of our approach, but I also think we need to balance defense assistance with our development and diplomatic efforts. How does the draft strategy differ from the approach of previous administrations with respect to balancing these, these so-called 3Ds? Mr. Chairman, you'll recall a year ago when I came before this committee for my confirmation hearing, I reviewed the testimony of, your, of the confirmation hearing of my predecessor in 2017. And at that time, you asked him for a Sahel strategy. And when I assumed office, we still did not have a Sahel strategy. So that was one of the first tasks For I took For the record, on. that's five years. <laughs> yes, I know. Right. Uh, and I tried to bring the lessons we have learned collectively as a nation from other theaters that are reflected in the Global Fragility Act. So you will see, in the, as your staff has looked at the, the new strategy, an explicit shift away from a security-dominated focus to a diplomatic and development emphasis. Those, of course, are difficult tasks, as I mentioned in my uh, initial statement, that will take some time. Mm -hmm. uh, as my colleagues have said, and as I, as I have said, we could use more resources uh, to help us implement those tasks. In uh, the current budget discussions underway in the administration, there's an effort to address the allocation of resources to reinforce the outcomes in the strategy. So I would say we absolutely uh, have taken the lessons uh, that we've learned, again, as a nation over the past 20 years, specifically in the Sahel in the past 10 years, and, and, and reoriented uh, the strategy uh, to reflect the concerns uh, and the lessons we've learned. Administrator Jenkins, any observations on that? Thank you, Senator. I've seen a lot of these strategies before, and for many of them, you can cut and paste the name of the country and the same objectives are in there. This isn't like that. This is a real, clear-eyed, honest assessment of where things are in the Sahel. It's not a pretty picture. What we have to do first, let's get these three countries back on democratic rails, and how do we help them address the problems that they find themselves in? As Assistant Secretary Fee said, this is, these are generational problems. They will not be fixed in five years, but we have to start now, and we now have a new strategy to do that that emphasizes not killing terrorists, but addressing the root causes. It's hard work, it's slow work, it needs to be resourced, but now we have a strategy and we can get on with it. Mm -hmm. Secretary Blyden. I would offer that we've learned that the counterterrorism approach 
um, that we have uh, employed in the Sahel and working with our allies and partners is not the only solution to the addressing the growing insecurity. I think we are shifting our approach from solely only focusing on the CT approach to being more inclusive of not just the whole of government approach, but also addressing things at the local level. So ensuring that African initiatives and initiatives that are led by African institutions and frameworks are being enabled uh, to be able to address the security concerns on their own. And that, I think, alongside with what we're doing on the governance end and what we're doing from a diplomatic end is helping provide a more holistic uh, approach to addressing these. I think, as both of my colleagues have said, this takes time and allowing the, uh, uh, the African partners to, to give us what they know will work is also key. Over. Well, let me follow up with you. In your written testimony, you mentioned that ending, I'm quoting you, ending U.S. security cooperation has affected our bilateral engagement with Chad. So did the coup affect our relationship at all? Are you suggesting that we engage in business as usual with a military junta? How, how would doing so reflect U.S. values in your view? And what message would that send throughout the region, and for that fact, throughout the world, by continuing to support a junta as though the coup had not taken place? Senator, I would not uh, uh, suggest that we should uh, support a junta. Um, I would say that in, in our pulling back and not engaging regularly with um, our, the militaries and many of the governments, um, our absence and our ability to be able to provide influence, whether it be at the governance structure or even training, where we emphasize human rights values, where we emphasize a democratic approach, um, has inhibited our ability to be able to have access. And our influence, I think, is one of the key things that the U.S. has been able to provide. Uh, so while I don't necessarily propose that we should uh, continue to uh, work with juntas, I do think having a, an ability to be able to work and talk to them um, to be able to report our influence is key. Well, talking to them uh, is different uh, than engaging in security cooperation with them in which we are providing uh, potentially resources, right? So one of the committee's jurisdiction is the question of arms sales. Uh, you know, it's very difficult uh, to be engaged in selling arms to a junta that has upended constitutional order in a country. And so that's one of the challenges uh, that I, I believe we have here. And it seems to me that our focus in the region has been for some time on a purely uh, counterterrorism. And, and, I, and I understand that that is an important function. But when it becomes the sole driver and when our engagement with military entities that are not under civilian control ultimately uh, continues and perpetuates them, uh, that's a problem. Um, let me ask one final question. I know that the draft strategy is a five-year strategy. How will the administration implement the strategy if three of the five countries in the Sahel are governed by illegitimate military juntas with shifting timelines for yielding power back to civilian authorities? Mr. Chairman, as we saw recently with uh, the engagement by the regional bloc ECOWAS with each of the governments in the region, uh, excluding Chad, which I can address separately, there is now a path to restore uh, uh, the transition to a stronger and more stable uh, democracy. Uh, and we can use 7008 does not deny us the use of resources to non-government entities to support uh, the pr practices and policies of, pr for example, civil society to encourage uh, th those successful transitions. Uh, in, in Chad, which is not a member of ECOWAS, uh, the government of Qatar has been hosting for the past five to six months talks between the government and the, their traditional insurgent rivals known as the political military groups. And uh, uh, those talks, they, they are now down to a final draft, which again would lay out a milestone to have a national dialogue, to draft a constitution, to have an election. <coughs> So our proposal is that we would use the resources that are available to us and any increase in resources to help consolidate these plans uh, to move towards uh, a democratic rule. All right. Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to follow up uh, quickly with uh, Ms. Blyden. Um, how is the Department of Defense adjusting its approach to training military personnel of countries in the Sahel? given the four coups that have affected the region in just the last two years. And I know that it's one of the really important things that we are able to do in, in terms of providing assistance is, is training military officers. What's changed within this region due to those four coups? 
we now have less partners to be able to work with. Um, I think as uh, Ambassador Fee noted, uh, the G5 partners, which uh, included uh, you know, five of the Sahelian partners, we're now down to two that we can actively work with. Um, and that training in our absence of being able to provide our influence uh, through security cooperation and uh, human rights training and values that we typically put forth um, is now absent um, from the larger uh, porous borders. I think what we are hoping to do is, is how I mentioned in my statement is work with those two partners that we still can work with to increase their involvement. We are also doubling down, I think, on other African partners who are willing and are capable and are interested in providing additional support to the Sahel. So we have partners in other regions, um, as you mentioned in the onset, uh, North African partners who have been doing training in the Sahel already with Sahel partners, and we're asking actively for them to take a, a stronger role in being able to provide what they've already learned from us in a secondary or tertiary training uh, type uh, security exporter, if you will, model. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Fee, uh, challenges with staffing at U.S. Embassy posts on the Sahel is currently a significant challenge in implementing U.S. policy in the Sahel and will be a major constraint to implementing the new interagency approval, uh, approved uh, Sahel strategy. How is the State Department making certain that President Biden's nominees for ambassadorial <laughs> posts in the Sahel are well qualified with prior experience serving in the region? In terms of uh, uh, not having sufficient staff in the entire State Department, as well as the specific challenges uh, for the Africa Bureau, as you're aware, uh, the, the what is known as the D Committee, the Deputies Committee, uh, handles the selection of nominees uh, for uh, Chief of Mission, and they look for diversity in background uh, and uh, in, in all in all ways uh, in making those nominations uh, that they present to the Secretary and to the President. Let me ask one more question with, with regards to the, uh, the State Department and how it is organized and how that may very well bear on the issues taking place in the Sahel today. Um, in my opening statement, I laid out the differences between different organizations as to how we treat different geographical parts of Africa. If you go back to 2011, uh, when NATO began its campaign against Libya's Muammar Gaddafi, Mali's government warned that Gaddafi's removal would destabilize Mali. Shortly after Gaddafi's fall in 2011, ethnic uh, Tuaregs who had served in Gaddafi's military returned to Mali, joining an insurgency against Mali's government in January of 2012 that was eventually co-opted by Islamist groups. Does this experience provide any lessons learned with regard to how our North African policy can affect the Sahel? Senator, as I mentioned when I spoke uh, to the chairman, I did a lot of research before I took this position, and I found that AF, the Africa Bureau, used to be part of the NEA Bureau, the Near Eastern and African Affairs Bureau. And it was broken apart about the time of decolonization to reflect the interests and priorities of sub-Saharan African nations. Absolutely, the, uh, the uh, uh, overthrow of Gaddafi uh, resulted in dramatic and negative impacts in the Sahel and in North Africa. Uh, so I absolutely agree with uh, uh, your concern about those outcomes. Um, 
However, I think we have a very strong relationship with the NEA Bureau, and we um, are able to work together uh, to look at the cross-cutting issues. Uh, I meet regularly with the uh, newly confirmed Assistant Secretary of State, Barbara Leaf, for Near Eastern Affairs, uh, and our embassies are in regular contact, and including uh, travel back and forth uh, uh, to coordinate and collaborate on uh, in issues. In Mali, specifically, we're looking at the implementation of the Algiers Accord, which resulted from the Tuareg Rebellion. So it's absolutely uh, important that we work uh, together. Uh, and I think this issue of how we organize ourselves has been under discussion in different ways for decades. Uh, but it's important that those of us in positions now work together continuously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses. Ms. Blyden, I think I'm going to focus on you because I'm an Armed Services Committee member. And these, these are questions that might be more appropriate there. But I'm, I'm curious. Um, the French have been doing counterterrorism operations in Mali since 2013. They have about 2,000 troops there. They've announced this year that they're going to withdraw those troops because of conflicts between their operations there and the, uh, the government of Mali. They're likely to redeploy some of those troops in Niger, where we have about 800 troops. How is the withdrawal of French and EU forces from Mali likely to affect U.S. military operations in the region? The shift in, in the French and, uh, the location and the repositioning um, is, is seen both as a, a, a challenge, but I think it's also a positive. I think as we've talked about, we see the spread uh, moving towards the coastal West Africa uh, countries, and we're seeing an opportunity with the French repositioning to really rethink where it is that we might need bolstering of African partners uh, to be able to continue to counter the, the violent extremist threat. And so the French are thinking through that with us. They're working with us and uh, the positioning of where we have our troops to make sure that there's enough coverage um, between the African partners, the French operations that they're doing, as well as uh, looking at where the peacekeeping mission is in Mali and um, where African partners have pro provided their own initiatives to be able to, uh, as I said, ensure we have coverage across the, the Sahel to try and prevent and counter what we see as a, as a spread towards the littorals. I think our operations and the support that we provide will continue in a way, but it will be spread more widely, I think, across the number of partners who will be doing uh, the work that they do. Uh, I don't want to take too long with this answer, but I do think it's important to note that there are other partners um, besides the French who we've been working with as well in this region, Task Force Tacuba, which has had uh, some European allies as well. And they are also thinking about how we can ensure that we have enough coverage um, to continue to prevent this, th this spread. The, the second of the three goals you mentioned in terms of the national defense strategy was shoring up partners, and you testified that Niger is sort of the, the, the sol most solid partner in the region. So if we take the U.S. forces, about 800, which is, I think, second highest, only following Djibouti, we take those 800 forces, and if some of the French forces come there too, that can serve both goals one and two of the three goals that you uh, mentioned. I, I, I am interested in the following up on the deadly ambush that happened in Niger in 2017. Four U.S. Army Green Berets lost their lives. Four troops from Niger were killed. It was an unusual mission. It was an advise and assist training mission. There was not an expectation that it would be kind of in a conflict zone. The conflict developed. The group that we, you know, uh, that, that killed our troops in Niger were not, was not a group that the U.S. had designated as a, as a terrorist group at that time. Um, what, what has been the assessment or alteration or reassessment of the advise and assist missions in the Sahel following the death of these uh, Green Berets? Senator, I would have to come back to you uh, on an answer on that. Um, as you know, the, the Tonga Tonga incident has been um, researched and widely uh, investigated <clears throat> to ensure that there has been accountability for the challenges that happened and occurred during that particular mission. Uh, but I would be remiss if I told you I knew exactly what the details of that, that were. So I would like to take that question for the record if I can. Um, we'll, we'll submit it in writing. And in particular, I, I'm aware of some of the analysis of what happened, but I'm particularly interested in whether the DOD has done adjustments or alterations to the advise and assist missions in the region as a result of those lessons learned. So we'll do a written question for the record that's specifically uh, on that point. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Um, 
So let me ask uh, another uh, question since I have the opportunity. There's no other uh, member seeking recognition at this point. Uh, I want to follow on on the ranking member's comments about hiring. Uh, numerous State Department direct hire positions at U.S. embassies in the Sahel remain unfilled. In uh, Niger, for instance, more than 40 percent of State Department direct hire jobs in our embassy are vacant. Overall, in the Sahel, 22 percent of U.S. direct hire positions remain unfilled. So how is it that regardless of uh, the strategy that we put together and that hopefully we will mutually agree upon, we will be able to implement such a strategy with the absence um, of that many direct hires and the absence of full USAID missions in Chad, Burkina Faso, Mauritania uh, in terms of implementing the strategy? Isn't it call for a... A, uh, a real commitment uh, to beef up uh, and to ensure that these direct hires and other important positions uh, get staffed in order to implement the, the strategy. Otherwise, we have a strategy on paper, but not an implementation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, I, I simply can't do my job uh, if we don't have people in the field. And that's where uh, I expect the fingertip uh, confidence uh, to understand what's going on and to make recommendations and to implement U.S. policy effectively. I think there are many components to this problem set. Uh, I talked about the general insufficient staffing for the State Department. We've talked about what the administration is trying to do uh, to compensate for previous years uh, that led us to that deficit. Uh, I've talked about the challenges. Some of those um, percentages you are referring to our specific specialities like um, uh, medical personnel or um, uh, IT personnel, uh, very hard to uh, compete in the current environment. We also lost a lot of counselor officers because we've tied um, the staffing of our counselors cone uh, to visa fees, and visa fees went down during the COVID era. Um, we're missing chiefs of mission in a lot of posts. As you know, uh, chiefs of mission are one way to attract and invigorate uh, a post-staffing uh, morale. And, uh, and then there are steps we can take that I've talked to you about that we're working on to increase incentives and to adjust the way in which we mm -hmm. recruit uh, for, for those well, posts. So it, that's a multi-pronged approach. Seems to be uh, the, uh, there needs to be a commitment from the top uh, to ensure that this happens. Administrator, how about uh, at AID? Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> As the Secretary alluded to, it's a complex problem. Those vacancies are partly due that we have many more positions around the world than we actually have foreign service officers to fill those positions for a variety of reasons. So it's not as though they're not in the Sahel, but they're somewhere else. There just aren't enough qualified staff. And Senator, as you mentioned, it's not just having, the right, having people in those places. We want the right people in those places. So that's where we are excited to be having a conversation about possible additional hiring authorities, other mechanisms. We are doing everything we can to hire more foreign service officers after what was a hiring freeze in the last administration. That, that affected the entire throughput of, at various levels. Um, so I could not agree more that we want the right people and more of them in the region to implement this strategy. Yeah. It seems to me that when you have difficulty in finding uh, uh, the right people and the people necessary, that you create some type of incentive to attract the right people that maybe you normally don't do. But one other question, I'm deeply concerned about the negative influence of Russian mercenaries in the Wagner group in Mali and across the Sahel. The draft strategy acknowledges the seriousness of this problem. But in the most recent State Department budget request, it doesn't appear to be a line item for countering <coughs> Russia's malign influence in the Sahel. So what actions are each of your agencies taking to counter Russia propaganda and the Wagner's group influence in Mali? Is there a specific fund to support countering malign influence in Africa in the budget request? Um, I'm trying to understand how we're going to do this. We recognize there's a problem. What are we going to do about it? Some of the steps uh, that are under consideration um, and actual planning uh, include trying to dry up uh, the source of financing, so looking at possible sanctions 
uh, looking at possible non-traditional measures such as um, the uh, illegal export of gold, uh, which is uh, something that is of great interest to Wagner. How can we uh, address those concerns? Uh, we're looking at deepening our exchange of information with African governments to make sure they understand fully what we understand about the impact of Wagner. And a third element uh, uh, which our Bureau of Political Military Affairs is undertaking is trying to develop uh, other options for security assistance. We're the best, but we're expensive and we're slow. Uh, and sometimes, quite rightly, as has been illustrated in this hearing, we uh, suspend uh, security assistance to reflect our values. Uh, so we want to deter governments in the region from turning to Wagner to fill their security needs. So we're looking to see what we can do in terms of developing alternative sources of security assistance. So, so those are some of the three, three areas in which we're trying to work mm -hmm. uh, to address the problem. Secretary Blyden. For the Department of Defense, uh, we've had uh, legislation 1332, which was in this year's NDAA, which provides uh, funding to both Southcom and AFRICOM to counter strategic competition on the continent and specifically uh, work at looking at China and also the Wagner Group in uh, Mali and across the Sahel. Mm -hmm. And we have global resources towards disinformation, but in the Sahel specifically, where disinformation, including pro-Russia disinformation, was a problem for some time. In Mali, that problem became exponentially larger once Wagner Group arrived and once the French left. I would never have thought I would see the day where people in Burkina Faso and Mali were waving pictures of Richard Wagner, a German composer who died in 1883 as some sort of hero. So we immediately pivoted some of our civil society programs programs working with youth and working with civil society on elections towards disinformation. We're about to send a CN up to you all for an additional $5.5 million, Molly specific, that is for tracking disinformation, the production of responsible production, responsible uh, consumption of information, and also a very robust monitoring, evaluation, and learning component so we can learn from this project as we go to other countries and spread that out because unfortunately, I think we're stuck with disinformation problems for quite some time. Look forward to the CN. Senator Coons. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and <coughs> Ranking Member Rounds. Uh, I am very encouraged by the level of uh, engagement and uh, concern and persistence here and by the engagement uh, by the administration, the release uh, of the uh, strategy by the administration for how to deal with this region. Um, and as each of you referenced in your testimony, the Global Fragility Act, which I worked on, for a number of years with members of this committee, um, calls for a coordinated strategic approach to um, challenges very similar to what we see in the Sahel, um, challenges of fragility where we need to work across the silos of defense, development, diplomacy, and bring in other partners, not just European partners, regional partners, to work with nations on the ground who are having challenges to deliver not just the right strategy, but the right people from the United States and to bring in NGOs and other uh, partners. So uh, I'd be interested in your view. The Global Fragility Act did not identify the Sahel, identified uh, the countries um, of the, geez, I'm sorry. Could any of you hear me? <laughs> Thank you. I don't think I've done that in a decade. Um, we're usually the ones saying, please, the microphone. Um, so the Global Fragility Act, um, based on Plan Columbia and um, the experience of many who served before me, of investing in stabilizing, uh, at one point, one of the most fragile countries in the Western Hemisphere and gradually moving through a coordinated strategy uh, towards a, a less conflict-ridden country. Um, there are already ways in which the conflict and the instability in the Sahel are leaching into each of the coastal countries of West Africa. Uh, but taking that general approach, hearing the questions of the members of the committee, um, how are we going to work better together as a country in addressing the pressing, the critical governance, development, and security needs of countries like Mali and Burkina? Um, how are we sustaining any uh, coordinated regional strategy? And what do you most need from us? I happen to also chair an appropriations subcommittee and spoke as recently as last night to the administrator of USAID about some of these hiring flexibilities. We wanna make sure that you're communicating effectively uh, with this committee and with other committees about exactly what do you need to deliver to meet this moment. If you would please in order, um, I'd just be interested in hearing 
How, what is our strategy for engagement with our partners and allies in the region and the other donors and the other countries that are capable of delivering development, diplomacy, and security assistance? Senator, thank you for your leadership uh, and uh, interest in innovating our policy in this area. Uh, one of the other components of the Sahel strategy uh, when I first, as I described when I first uh, took on this task and started looking at it, is I recommended that you say join the Sahel Alliance, uh, which is a grouping of donors, uh, to make sure that we were uh, working in partnership, uh, as this committee has directed us to do, particularly with our European partners uh, in the Sahel. I don't know if you've been informed, but you know we recently had a Global Chiefs of Mission conference, and uh, we, uh, we had a seminar uh, with all of us involved in implementing uh, the Global Fragility Act in coastal West Africa. Uh, and it, uh, everyone is extremely excited about the new flexibilities and the new resources, uh, and there are detailed plans that have been set forward. And one of the key components of the conversation was how to make sure that we stay coordinated and knitted up, and how we can demonstrate that we're using those resources and flexibilities, not only to good effect in the Sahel, but perhaps to come back to you to recommend maybe how to carry over uh, that approach uh, to other problem sets. Of course, the Sahel is in a different place than coastal West Africa, regrettably in a worse place. Uh, we have, uh, frankly, a little bit more to work with in terms of partners and capabilities in, in coastal West Africa. So I think it, it, it's a good uh, first, uh, um, uh, if you will, demonstration effect uh, of the approach. Um, I, I have joked with Rob that I wish state had an OTI uh, I have been looking very hard at the challenges we have faced in, in, uh, in the Sahel uh, and elsewhere in Africa in terms of uh, military coups, uh, and how can we respond? Uh, are we agile enough? Uh, do we have the right staff? Do we have the right resources to go in and help uh, governments put things back on track uh, to take uh, actions like the ones Rob referred to uh, with regard to um, uh, countering disinformation? So if you're interested in work, it's hard for us, for me, for example, to predict, Chad, it looks to me like they may get to this agreement, but I can't really tell you where they'll be in three months or six months. Uh, so sometimes it's hard, given our budget planning cycle, uh, to, to, to um, uh, be adequately prepared uh, for uh, a very fluid and dynamic environment. Thank you. Be happy to talk with you about that in more detail. Mr. Chairman, can the other two answer, or should we, if you could briefly? Senator, first, thank you so much for your leadership on the Global Fragility Act. Uh, my team is on point at USAID for working with our regional bureaus on implementation of the strategy. I can talk for a long time. You don't have a lot of time. We would love to spend time getting into detail on exactly what we're doing, how we're doing it, what we're looking to do, and what we need. But we do need additional flexibility. Thank you so much, all of you, for the flexibility we've been given, not just under the terms of the GFA, but lately but we could always use more, much more. We need to do more to get your trust so we can have more flexible resources and keep that communication going. That's something we would like to have from you, that partnership. We need your patience. 10 years is a long time, but we're still 23 and a half, you know, 10 year plans in our own country. And we're not sure what the constitution always means when we're in agreement with each other. So I love that you uh, reference Plan Columbia. Columbia is an example I often use because once security was there, and the political will was there, and the strategic patience was there, our government worked in an interagency fashion that is extremely rare. That is what we need to do and have to do if we're going to make the Global Fragility Act succeed the way we need it to be. Thank you. Uh, I'll be even briefer. Uh, flexibility of uh, funding and resources, I think also uh, giving a little bit of latitude on time. Uh, I had the privilege of working on Plan Columbia when I sat on the Hill um, and used that to work with a, a number of congressional members on the House Armed Services and HVAC uh, to develop an Africa Act um, that I think mirrored what Plan Columbia did. I think the interagency coordination and the ability to be able to look out over a, a period of time is something that is needed uh, for Africa as well. And so I would encourage uh, to maybe revisit that legislation 
um, that was introduced a few years ago um, to see if it could uh, be something that could be employed in the Africa context as well. I think from a security side, um, coordination, the U.S. Department of Defense has an ability and the U.S. in general has an ability to be able to convene partners together. And that's a, a strength that we have that um, I think will enable us to be able to be more successful in the Africa context. Thank you all very much. Um, I am very concerned about Russian disinformation, particularly around Ukraine um, and whether or not it is their aggression or our sanctions that are causing significant uh, hunger and development um, disruptions around the world. I look forward to working with all of you uh, and your agencies are, are around that challenge. Thank you very much for your forbearance, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a comment before I turn to Senator Rounds. Uh, you know, there's always uh, the friction. Be, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'll turn to Senator Brown Holland first. Um, there's always the friction uh, of uh, you want flexibility uh, but we need justification because we are responsible uh, for the, you know, fiduciary responsibilities here to the American people, as well as understanding the policy. So if you help us understand what you're going to do with the flexibility and give us some universe of, of what it is, the type of thing you're going to do, it will be far more helpful to achieve the goal. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for your, your testimony and for your service. Uh, I know there's been a, a lot of focus, at least conceptually, on the new strategy, and I've long been concerned uh, that we don't strike the adequate balance between going after terrorists and investing in long-term stability in terms of democracy and development. So I'm pleased to see this, uh, this strategy uh, being unfolded. Um, I, I would like to get a little more granularity. Uh, maybe um, Assistant Secretary Fee, you could give me an example, whether it's Mali, Burkina Faso, Chad, how this, how we're, how we're doing something different because of this new strategy in one of those countries, or, or pick another example. I, just a little bit of meat on the bone would be helpful, I think, in terms of um, aligning resources with the new strategy. Great. What we are trying to do right now in discussions about FY22 is work within the administration to reallocate resources uh, into the democracy and governance space. So we've talked a little bit here about uh, the difficulty of working with military-led governments, but there are many components of a society that support a transition, women, uh, active, NGO activists, uh, constitution drafting exercises, those types of things. So we're looking to apply those resources uh, to implementing partners that have a long track record like D, uh, um, NDI, IRI, IFES, and whatnot, uh, and also working with the regional organization ECOWAS to support technical advisors that they might provide. Um, I mentioned also that we're discussing how we can identify uh, uh, resources, targeted personnel resources to go out and help advise on how to move out of a, a military-run government to a democratic government. So that's the, I think, the first priority that we're looking to reshift our allocation into those types of programs. Got it. And so we're, we're we can expect to see that in the allocation of AID resources, prim principally, or that you're also include. What are the other resources are we talking about? I have a very very tiny budget, um, uh, and I have worked hard to befriend. Uh, F in the State Department, and but seriously, I have support from our leadership uh, to try and implement the strategy, and we're, we're doing that in partnership with USAID. Right. And so, it, uh, uh, Assistant Administrator Jenkins, so that's an area that you can continue to brief this committee and, and subcommittees with respect to, as you said, there's a long list and it gets some detail, but we would, I'd be interested in seeing how exactly you're implementing this. We'd be very happy to, to start that conversation and have that an active conversation. I'll just add, the way we got to the strategy was new as well. With development, USAID as a full partner at the table working on this together and stressing the need for the development work we do, not just the counterterrorism thing. Um, that in itself, and the fact that we have this now strategy that is a shared strategy that we all are committed to, is something that is, is a, a great innovation. Got it. Um, Ms. Blyden, I know that Senator Rounds um, asked you about, uh, how, you know, the number of countries where we've seen recent coups, and I think you responded that, well, that does mean we have fewer partners uh, going forward. Um, I guess I want to back that up because what we've seen over time is a lot of the coup leaders in many cases are organizations, individuals that we have had a previous relationship with. Uh, 
And I think that's probably what drove some of the new strategy, is trying to rethink how we go about doing that. Uh, Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs and I today are introducing um, legislation um, that would, it's called the Un Upholding Human Rights Abroad Act, and what it would do is expand the Leahy Law requirements uh, to uh, also include a couple other DOD-based programs that are not currently in included. This is not an effort to tie people's hands, but it's an effort to accomplish what I think is the goal of this uh, new strategy, to make sure that we are not um, unwittingly uh, supporting and funding those who turn around and undermine uh, democracy and development. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, lessons we've learned in some of these countries where uh, despite, um, you know, d despite what we thought were our best efforts, um, we ended up having the boomerang come around and hit us in the head. Absolutely. I think maybe to answer part of your last question and then transition into this one, um, what we're doing differently is uh, that even though we've always had a buy with and through approach, and you'll hear AFRICOM talk about that, uh, it's been buy with and through a number of different partners. We're really focusing now on the African partners and looking at the multiple levels of where it is that we see uh, engagement has been successful and where we maybe have uh, lacked in providing additional um, support. For us and in, in our support to the Sahel strategy, we are looking at investing more in our civilian-led defense institutions, so regional centers like the Africa Center for Strategic Studies that focuses on uh, institutional capacity building when it comes to governance and parliamentary and managing security resources. We're doing more to invest in that area. We're also working more with our Institute for Security Governance, which is under the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, to provide additional training at the multiple levels, so whether it's senior leaders uh, emerging security sector leaders um, or at the training and, you know, sort of foot soldier level, we're ensuring that we are giving the entire holistic approach uh, to what it means to have uh, security assistance and security cooperation from both a governance standpoint as well as uh, the trainer, advise, and assist, which we're typically known for. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know we're getting down close to the end of this particular meeting, and I just I have one question. I'd like it to go to each of you, and perhaps in less than a minute you could respond back. Whether it be in, in our diplomatic efforts or our economic development efforts or our national defense efforts, we have to recognize that there is a great powers competition going on. Uh, Russia and China are both very actively engaged in, on the African continent, and they are also very actively engaged within the Sahel. What is it that we're doing that perhaps China and Russia are not doing, and vice versa? What is it that Russia and China are doing that we are not doing with regard to this particular area in your specific areas of expertise? And I would uh, begin with the ambassador, please. Thank you, Senator. Um, that's almost an easy question because I think, generally speaking, we are the preferred partner in every sector uh, for Africans. Uh, we care about humans. We care about civilians. Uh, we care about unleashing their potential. Uh, and that, those are not uh, f uh, areas of focus for Russia or China. Uh, so that, I think, is the biggest difference, that we work beyond governments uh, with all sectors of society uh, to encourage governance that is inclusive and unleashes the potential of, of, of society. Mr. Jenkins? I agree wholeheartedly. I would sum it up as partnership. Russia and China enter into transactional relationships. We, if we're doing what we should be doing, is listening, partnering, and working not just at the national level, but localization, working with local people, finding them where they are, helping them with what they want help on, and working in true partnership. Ms. Biden. I agree with both of my colleagues and would say that uh, we stand on the foundation of democracy, human rights, and governance. And I think the other thing that we offer is uh, civilian, civil military relations and the understanding of how this works symbiotically um, to ensure that there is good governance in a country. And I think the transactional approach that both Russia and China take um, have resonated with our partners. They understand that we care. We understand that we're there to enable them uh, for the long haul, and that we understand that uh, an organic African solutions are, are critical to the success of, of security in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rounds. Uh, one final question for the, uh, and the rest I'll submit for the record. 
Following the 2012 military coup in Mali, we imposed travel bans on more than 80 individuals responsible for orchestrating or supporting the coup. We imposed similar travel bans on military coup leaders in Mauritania in 2008, Guinea in 2009, guinea bissau in 2012, and the Central African Republic in 2013. Both ECOWA and the European Union have imposed personal targeted sanctions on the leaders of the latest military coup in Mali. The United States, however, has yet to take such actions in response to recent coups in Mali, Burkina Faso, Chad, Guinea for that matter. So Ambassador, how do you explain this break with precedent? Shouldn't we have a consistent policy for imposing travel bans or other sanctions on military officers who seize power unconstitutionally? Mr. Chairman, such sanctions authority is an important tool uh, that we can apply. Uh, and we should continuously review when are the appropriate circumstances uh, to apply in partnership in particular with, with ECOWAS uh, so that our actions are reinforcing. Um, I think these particular uh, changes in government, while very unwelcome, reflected complex circumstances, and there was an effort underway to see if we could encourage these leaders to get back on track. Uh, I think we've seen with the recent ECOWAS negotiations at least a stated commitment to get back on track. Uh, and so we should keep that tool in mind. But the, the objective was uh, to drive the parties back towards a democratic transition. Well, I would just say that both ECOWAS and the European Union have imposed uh, those type of sanctions. So if we want to be in concert with them. I don't understand why we have not. And I understand it's a powerful tool. I, I get the sense that the Bureau is adverse to sanctions use um, and reticent about doing it. And I don't understand the limited tools of peaceful diplomacy that we have, uh, why we refrain from it when uh, other elements are not pursuing our interests and when we would be in synchrony uh, with those entities uh, in Africa that saw it important to go ahead and do. So we'd, we'd love to hear from you uh, on that. Um, and, and, I, and I'd like you to more fully respond for me in the record. I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming before the committee to give their testimonies, uh, while ultimately our African partners must lead the way in addressing the problems in the Sahel. The least we can do is ensure that the assistance we provide is as impactful as possible. I look forward to continuing uh, to dialogue with the administration on the strategy as it is finalized. The record for this hearing will remain open until the close of business on Thursday, July the 14th, 2022. Please ensure that questions for the record are submitted no later than that date. And please uh, be responsive as you can, as fully as you can, when you receive them. With the thanks of the committee for your testimony, this hearing is adjourned.